Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. My name is Alan Stephen, and I'll be your host for today's webinar organised by the Society of Chemical Industries, Science and Enterprise Group, and the event's entitled Growing Your, Your Business in Japan. Whilst this is an SCI event, it's being hosted by LabLinks, and I'd like to extend a big thanks to the team at LabLinks for making this happen today. If you'd like to find out more about how LabLinks brings people together, please log on at lablinks.io after today's event. So today's event is about growing your business in Japan. Japan is one of the world's leading economies with an attractive living environment and a developed consumer base, but big firms often struggle to penetrate it and find it complex to do business with Japan. With that in mind, we wanted to put on an event to share learning and cross-cultural tips that could be of value, particularly to, to smaller firms. So um, our second speaker is, is Gerhard Fassol. Gerhard has a, a PhD in semiconductor physics and has been an entrepreneur in Tokyo since 1997. In his present role as CEO of Euro Technology Japan, he's helped develop hundreds of businesses. Gerhard, I'd like you to join me on stage. Okay, shall we start? Perfect. So I, I'm, I'm very sorry for all these technical issues. So now it seems to be solved. <clears throat> this is just a short self introduction. I've worked since with Japan since 1984, so that's more than uh, 30 years now. I came here first in 1984 to set up help. That was just after my PhD at Cambridge University to uh, help set up research cooperation with NTT labs, and <clears throat> then. In the summers between 84 and 90, I worked on research cooperations with Tokyo University as a faculty. I was faculty at, at uh, Cambridge University Cavendish Lab and Trinity College at that time. And I moved to Japan. I was manager of the Hitachi Lab in Cambridge. And then I moved to Japan, was five years uh, associate professor at Tokyo University, has had a national uh, research project on spin electronics, which would be uh, uh, it would be quantum computing today in this direction. And then in 97, I set up my company. And since 97, I've been working with hundreds, hundreds of companies with Madonna and New York Police Department and Siemens and uh, NTT communications on Europe strategy, mainly M&A and cross-border business development. And also companies come to us if it doesn't work out in Japan. Um, so I was five years, I was uh, associate professor at uh, Tokyo University Electric Engineering Department, which is the number one elite university here in Japan. And then I was also uh, board director of a Japanese stock market listed cybersecurity company. I was guest professor at uh, Kyushu University, uh, studying projects in Kyushu. And so I've been working with Japan in Tokyo now, in Japan now for uh, that's uh, 1991, it's almost 30 years now. So if you go to the next slide, that are uh, three, uh, uh, three pictures which kind of give a bit of my background. There's Trinity College, where I was 13 years, first for my PhD, then as, uh, as a faculty member. And I'm building up Trinity in Japan now as a uh, kind of a Japan organization and alumni organization of Trinity College, where we where I organize also Zoom discussions and bring, that has already led to new cooperations between research leaders in Japan and, and Trinity fellows and, and students of Trinity. Then uh, the, in the middle, there's a picture of myself in the lab in the Cavendish, and I had a similar lab, optics lab in, in, in Tokyo University as well. And on the right is a picture of my great grandfather, Ludwig Boltzmann. And I'm uh, for 10 years now, I'm organizing Ludwig Boltzmann Forum here in Tokyo at the Austrian Embassy as a leadership forum, bringing it together like chairman of uh, vice chairman of uh, JR East I had invited or the sleep specialist, uh, top uh, sleep researcher of Japan. So I organized like a leader, leadership community. So uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So 
I thought I'll uh, talk about three or four points today. One is why Japan? So why do you want to build a business in Japan? And uh, Japan is the third largest economy. So number one is US, number two, China, number three, Japan. Number four is like Germany. Uh, now, for well, interestingly, for many US companies, uh, which are important today, like software as a service or cloud-based companies, they do not do business in China. So for cloud-based and uh, many other high-tech companies in US, the number one biggest uh, foreign market for them looking out from US is Japan, number one. And that perspective is different in Europe because for like, let's say UK companies, usually the number one foreign market will be like Germany or like US but uh, or China, but uh, people in UK wouldn't think about Japan as the number one uh, uh, priority and number one size foreign market. So that's pers perspective if, is uh, different for European companies and US companies, which is quite noticeable here in, in, in Tokyo. So we've been working for a lot of US companies for which uh, we are just uh, in discussions again with a Silicon Valley uh, uh, cloud-based uh, software as a service company for which quite clearly Japan is the number one market outside US. Now, other factors why Japan is important is innovation. Many unique business models, technologies come from Japan and there's a strong science technology base. It's also a democracy and there's no internet uh, censorship. There's no censorship of any kind in Japan. Of course, there are laws, but there's no censorship. All other countries here, like South Korea and, and Singapore, for example, do have internet censorship. Now, second point is how to build your business. Uh, third, how to sell in Japan, and then how to get uh, how to get started. So, can you switch next slide, please? Um, okay. So, with this uh, view graph, I want to give you an idea about the size of Japan, because uh, I've, in my experience, many uh, uh, people in Europe, even leaders of big corporations, don't have a good uh, experience about the size. They don't have a feeling uh, for the size of, of Japan. Uh, so for this, I want to show you uh, this view graph. I hope you can read it. Japan has uh, islands, big islands. The biggest island is uh, Honshu, and on Honshu there are different regions. The biggest region is Kanto. Kanto is the area around Tokyo. So Kanto has about uh, 40 million people population and some of the world's largest companies. Uh, this uh, government is here. And in terms of size, uh, Kanto is about the same size as uh, South Korea, or like Turkey, the, economically, or Italy. No? Then uh, the second largest area of uh, Japan is Kinki, or or uh, or, or uh, Kansai, which is the area around uh, Osaka, Kyoto, Nara, Kobe. And uh, traditionally, uh, many pharma companies originate from Osaka area, and there are still many pharma companies are there. Electronics companies are there. In Kyoto, you have a very unique startup culture. You have ceramics companies are very strong. Kyocera is there. And uh, the Nintendo is in Kyoto. So Kyoto has a very unique business culture and uh, it's also very large. Uh, so uh, the Kansai area is economically as large as Philippines or South Africa, but the character is, of course, very different. You know, Osaka area has a lot of you know, strong universities, like the Center for Regenerative Medicines and Cell Therapy is uh, centered around uh, Kyoto University. And also there's a Kobe uh, after the uh, earthquake uh, in the 90s, uh, the, to revive the economy of Kobe, the Japanese government in, invested a lot of money to build a regenerative medicine-focused uh, biohub uh, or bio-ecosystem in, in Kobe and also in Osaka and in, in Kyoto. 
And so there are several other regions. So for example, Singapore, if you think about Singapore, then Singapore economically is about the same side as, uh, as Kyushu, which is uh, the westernmost uh, large island of Japan. So this is just to give you a, an idea about uh, the size. So in Europe, many people, their mind share, when they think about Asia, then Singapore has a very large mind share. Of course, Singapore is a very important uh, country, but in terms of comparing with Japan, then you know Japan is economically very much larger than Singapore. Uh, economically, it compares to about the uh, size of, of Kyushu or uh, size of Kanagawa Ken, which is an area around south of uh, south of Tokyo. Okay, so next uh, view graph, please. Uh, can you give? Uh, okay. So uh, when you think about building business in Japan, then uh, at some point when you grow, you will need to think of Japan as a matrix. So you will need to think about Japan in terms of uh, regions, which I just showed, you know, in, uh, introduced in the previous slide. And now in this slide, I'm going by industry sector. So if you, uh, many Silicon Valley software companies, for example, which uh, do cloud-based business processes, they address all uh, regions of Japan and all business sectors. So they will need to have within their company this uh, 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 matrix type approach for the business development in Japan. So developing uh, for each sector in each uh, area of Japan. So if you look at industry sectors, they are uh, the government of Japan, uh, of course, measures the size of uh, the economy and has this classification of industry sectors. So you can uh, 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 classify the industry in, in different ways, but one way is to do it by the size of the industry sectors in terms of sales. Another one would be in terms of value add, which will give you a different ranking. But in terms of sales, the largest industry sector is retail. Then the second largest is manufacturing. So if you are chemical industry, if you are addressing chemical industry or you're addressing pharmaceutical industry, then this will be within this manufacturing sector. Then you have construction. Medical is another uh, area of interest, of course, for you, and transportation, communications, and so on. And in each of these sectors is the second or third largest globally. So, for example, even real estate, uh, Japan's real estate uh, industry is uh, one of the well, like second largest or third largest globally after US. Okay, so if you go to the next, now we are going to dig down in the industry sector. So we'll pick uh, the... Uh, we'll pick four industry sectors which are of industry uh, of interest, I think, for the audience here today. Manufacturing and information communications, professional, scientific, medical, healthcare, welfare. So just let's look at the lowest one here, me medical healthcare welfare. Uh, the size of the medical welfare area is about business area. It's about, in terms of business size, it's about... 700 billion dollars so if you compare that with nhs of england or like department of health social care of england the size of that is about 200 billion dollars so you can see that the uh, health and uh, social care in uh, england is about 200 billion for japan it's about 700 billion so you can see this uh, size comp comparison. Another interesting uh, factor I want to show here is the number of companies. So you can see if you look at the manufacturing sector, you have half a million companies. Or like if you look at medical healthcare, also you've got half a million uh, companies. So the reason I show you that is that if you address, for example, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies and you want to partner or get investment from or sell to pharmaceutical companies, which would be here in manufacturing, then you are starting with half a million companies. So in order to find the ones which you really want to talk to, it needs quite a lot of work, intensive uh, systematic search, search work. And so that's what I want to show here. So next slide, please. 
now we'll dig again one step deeper, which is the pharma industry. So if you uh, just look at the, let's say you want to sell or partner or get investment from pharma industry, then uh, Japan is the third largest uh, pharma industry market. Um, the first one is US, second one is China, third one Japan, and then Germany, France, Italy, UK. So if you go to the next slide, please, we dig uh, even more into the pharma market. Uh, here I'm showing uh, the top 14 uh, pharma groups of Japan. So if you want to partner, sell, you know, get as a customer joint development, license your pharmaceutical developments or sell your, you know, uh, chemical services to the pharma industry, then you have here the list of the 14 top uh, pharma groups. These uh, top pharma groups together are, uh, have about $100 billion sales. Uh, the largest ones are Takeda with 30 billion sales, Chugai, um, another one is, uh, you know, like Mitsubishi Taba, Tanabe or like uh, Sumitomo Pharma with $5 billion. Each one of those is a very substantial company um, with their own specialities, their own history, their own character. And then in addition to that, you have foreign companies, pharma companies active here, like no, uh, Novartis, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and so on. But then if you go to the next slide, so, sorry, next slide. Uh, uh, okay, so in addition to these top 15 pharma groups, you have in our platform, in our database, and the companies we work with, some are customers, some we are in discussions with, there are another 100 uh, pharmaceutical companies, and then in regenerative medicine, cell therapy sector, there are about 230 Japanese companies. So if you want to to business, uh, like you want to sell or you want to partner or get investment from or sell a company to or, or invest or acquire in the Japanese pharma sector, you have to deal with this 100 10 uh, roughly pharmaceutical companies and uh, systematically work out which ones are the ones which you uh, want to work with. Uh, so <laughs> one reason I tell you that is that I found that in cases where customers come to us, let's say European pharma company will come to us and they've been already visiting Japan three times, then what I find is, for example, they will uh, 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 attend the Yokohama Biopharma conference, for example, then who they meet tends to be by accident, you know? So they will meet, let's say 20 people, but the, uh, they are not systematically searched for out of these hundred, you know? They, they meet people who they uh, happen to meet at, at this conference, you know. So because all these hundred companies will not attend, for example, the big uh, bio conference in Yokohama. Can you go to the next one? Okay, uh, the structure of the Japanese pharma sector is uh, quite a little bit different than in Europe. So in Japan, you have the traditional pharma companies, including this for, uh, big 14 or 15, which I mentioned to you. Then in addition, you have a large number, quite a substantial number of new entrants. These are like brewery companies, electrical conglomerates, or rubber companies, for example, there's a company called JSR, Japanese Synthetic uh, Rubber. They used to make synthetic rubber for car tires, which in, in, in the meantime, they have sold that division. And they have moved into uh, a pharmaceutical biospace. So you have uh, non-traditional pharma companies entering the pharma space in Japan for diversifications or for pivots. A very successful such pivot is Fujifilm, which I'm sure you've heard about. Fujifilm is the Japanese equivalent of Kodak. Uh, it's a, a, a used to be a photographic company, which was st uh, uh, started in Japan, uh, you know, as an answer to the U.S. Kodak. And in the meantime, they have pivoted to some very successfully pivoted to a number of new areas, uh, including. Uh, contract cell manufacturing. So today they are one of the biggest contract cell manufacturing companies and they're very actively acquiring. So they have uh, acquired companies recently in Denmark, in UK, in Germany, in US to build up their 
contract cell manufacturing. Uh, then you have ventures, of course, and then you have uh, very strong medical equipment uh, uh, industry in Japan. Uh, one, one of the examples is Olympus, but there are many, many more. Okay, can you go to the next um, slide, please? Uh, okay, so uh, another reason to do business in Japan is innovation. So I, I'm picking one example here, just very recent. Uh, Moderna, who you will know, it's a company called uh, in, uh, uh, started maybe 10, 15 years ago in, in Boston, Massachusetts, and <coughs> they developed, uh, they are developing mRNA therapies, including, of course, this very famous uh, vaccine, which I got injected with five times uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and they initially, they entered the Japanese market very rapidly, of course, because there was a very urgent need for the vaccine and the market and the need and the encouragement by the Japanese government to bring their um, mRNA a COVID vaccine to Japan. So they didn't have the time to set up their own subsidiaries. So initially they brought the vaccine to market and into the arms of the population here via Takeda. So they had an arrangement with Takeda, the big, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest pharma companies here. So when I uh, received my vaccinations, it was always under the joint, main, uh, primarily under the name of Takeda. And, but about half a year ago, I think uh, Moderna has uh, started their own subsidiary. They are in the process now of transferring the permissions, uh, the, the licensing and the registrations of their uh, therapies or their vaccination, uh, vaccines. They are transferring that now from, the, from Takeda to uh, Moderna. And very interestingly, Moderna has for the first time ever uh, acquired a venture and that was in Japan. In Tokyo, it was a it's a, uh, a venture called Okri, Okri Zero Genomics, uh, which is a Tokyo-based uh, venture uh, with uh, developing a certain class of tools for cell-free synthesis and uh, uh, production of plasma DNA, which is a building block for um, uh, mRNA manufacturing. So for $85 million. So the reason I'm telling you that is uh, several reasons. One reason is that we have a lot of innovation in Japan, which is interesting for foreign companies. And uh, so this shining example, it's not the only example, but it's one of the outstanding examples is the acquisition by Moderna of uh, this company, Ori, Ori Zero Genomics for $85 million. Now, so if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, I'm showing you here uh, that uh, this company, Ori Zero, is not the only venture company. Uh, so you can see the growth of venture investments in startups in Japan. So you can see there's really uh, the start of starting up of investment in startups is a bit later than in Europe and much later than US, but it's now on a very rapidly increasing uh, growth curve. The total investments in ventures is still quite a lot lower than in, in the UK or EU or US, but it's growing and it's uh, going to continue to grow. What is also very interesting is you can see that uh, about one third of investments in uh, uh, Japanese startups uh, last uh, in 2021, so two years ago, is by VCs, and one third, a full one third, is by foreign companies. So for, foreign companies are very interested and uh, uh, also welcome to invest in Japanese ventures. And uh, there are many, many case stories, including the pharma and chemical space. So if you go to the next uh, view graph, please. Um, how to build your business in Japan. So. Uh, I think you. The, it's better you have a long-term vision where you want to be in, let's say, five years or ten years uh, when you enter Japan. Uh, and the recommended long-term target in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases, is to build up your own 
uh, enterprise in Japan, you know, to build up your own leadership team, to uh, build up your own community of enthusiastic Japanese customers who you serve and who you listen to and learn from and who you partner with, to build your own partnership network uh, who then serve customers uh, for you, uh, to build your own value in Japan and to become a trusted member of the Japanese community in your field and uh, even better, become a leader in your field in Japan. So if you're a leader, for example, in UK or you're a leader globally or you're a leader in US in your field, then why not become a leader in Japan? So let's say Moderna, which I just mentioned, uh, they are on the way to become a leader in the emerging field of mRNA. Uh, therapy development, for example. You know, they will speak at conferences here. They will be, uh, you know, valued members in this community. So if you do it the right way, you will not be seen as an outsider, but as an insider in Japan. Uh, another shining example is uh, uh, Salesforce.com, for example. They are, uh, they are a shining, uh, you know, northern star in the SAS community in Japan. And young uh, students want to work there. And it will it become top in the rankings of the most popular places to find jobs in and so on, you know. So that is really uh, what I just outlined here is like one ideal development which you could aim for. And many companies uh, do that and actually get there. Uh, but not every company gets to this uh, kind of ideal situation. But I think uh, that is a long a recommended long-term target it not many companies manage it and not uh, not for in every case it's the best way to do it but in in most cases like that and uh, then these uh, very successful companies they will uh, do r d in japan they will learn from japan for other markets they will do venture investments in japan and there are many examples of companies like uh, this, including uh, UK companies, which are doing that. Like, uh, AstraZeneca, for example, they, I think they're on the way to getting uh, to this kind of ideal in-community situation. Okay, so uh, this is like a long-term target. So I think if you have a long-term target, then you can kind of work back backwards and decide, okay, what should be the first step and why should I do the first step and how much should I invest or should I invest, you know? So if you have a long-term vision in mind, then it will be easier for you to uh, get started and take the right decisions along the way. Okay, so next uh, step, please. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, okay. So. So how do you get to this long-term target? Of course, you have the constraints. So you have to be aware of your constraints. So building up your own company, hiring people, hiring a team, uh, that costs investment, costs money. So some countries, uh, companies do have that money, but even then it's a question of risk management. You know, you, you have to see that you don't, uh, you uh, have to stage your investment, you know, by, uh, uh, step by step by step, you know, to see that your first step is successful and then do your second step and then invest more and so on. And uh, if you look at, you know, my, uh, entrance, uh, successful entrants like, uh, like salesforce.com, for example, they have done that. They have invested enough at each stage, but they're investing stage uh, step by step by step. No? If you don't have money to invest, then why don't you think the other way around and get investment from Japanese companies into your company? Japanese companies invest very much uh, in Europe, in UK, in US in, uh, to acquire technology, to acquire know-how or to go get access to people. Or let's say in UK, they would uh, access, uh, for example, they would invest in companies in the Cambridge, Oxford, London area in order to access the communities they are via the people employed by the companies they invest in. Okay. So uh, next step is uh, how to sell in Japan. If you go to the next uh, next uh, slide. So let's say uh, you have decided uh, you don't want to sell up a set up a company yet, or you already have a company and now you want to sell. So then you have to 
see what is the value proposition for your product or your services in the in the eyes of your Japanese customer and uh, not in your eyes but in the eyes of the Japanese customer and uh, quite surprisingly a few uh, uh, surprisingly many European companies fail in Japan because the value proposition is not right it, <laughs> typical examples are retailers. I know at least, I think, five European retail chains which failed in uh, Japan. I won't uh, name any names, but there are, there's a ger big German one, a big French one, and a very big UK uh, retail chain, which in their countries have very famous brands. But uh, in Japan, the pitfall is that if nobody knows your brand in Japan, you don't have a brand in Japan. And if you are a retail chain, usually it's hard to see what kind of value you can bring into Japan, you know, and then such companies will fail in Japan. And you need uh, trust. Or oh, another example is IKEA the first time. IKEA is very successful in Japan now, but it's the first, second entry. They failed on the first entry, then they made like 20 year break. And after 20 years later, they came again and learned from the first mistake. And uh, now they are here again. And uh, you need, the most important thing is trust. You need to have trust in Japan. So you need to uh, set up your company in the way and hire the people so that you can gain uh, trust of your business partners, of the community, of your customers. You have to understand the competitive situation and people are key. When you talk to people, for example, to sell, you have to know who you talk to. And that's in Japan. It's not, if you talk with a Japanese company, it's uh, not that e often uh, for foreigners, not so easy to understand what actually the role of your the person you talk to is inside his or her company. And uh, because to do that, you really need to know, understand the inside of his or her company. And you also need to look at the Japanese side of the business card and understand what the Japanese title actually means. If you lo only look at the English side of the business card, often you can't really understand what that person is inside the company, even including the top people. And you have to do customer service to Japanese standards. Uh, we had a customer, a German middle-sized company, which was, uh, they are have 500 years history in Germany. They sell high precision parts to BMW, Volkswagen, Mercedes. They're highly respected in Germany. And they came to us and say, what are we doing wrong in Japan? And we found out once we have been uh, doing the due diligence, worked for them for a while and doing some research on uh, what the Japanese co their customers are thinking about them and so on. We found out that they were on the blacklist of uh, a number of uh, Japanese blue chip manufacturers, which would have been the key customers for them. And they were on the blacklist because of unreliable customer service. So the levels of the response time, the quality, the perfection, usually is uh, the standards are much higher than in Europe usually. So uh, usually the response time to a customer service request at top companies in Japan is measured uh, like in minutes or in hours and not in days or weeks, uh, as sometimes when people go on holy long holidays in Europe, for example. So you have to think about that when you interact with Japanese companies. If you want to sell to Japanese companies, you have to be extremely responsive and uh, uh, and you have to fulfill their expectations and not yours if you want to sell. Okay, next uh, uh, view graph, please. This is an actual uh, project which we were doing. On the left-hand side, you see it's a European uh, family owned about $2 billion industrial company, which was our customer. And on the right-hand side, you see the outline structure of a Japanese company. It, it is, it, that's a company on the, uh, listed on the stock exchange, also about $2 billion sales. So this uh, 
So one, a $2 billion European company came to us, their corporate strategy office came to us, and uh, they said uh, for the last five years, they have been thinking of acquiring one of the business di divisions of this a large Japanese corporation, and they didn't. Uh, they never succeeded to start a conversation about this ac potential acquisition, and they asked our help. So uh, we uh, uh, they signed a contract with us, you know, and started working with us. So the first thing we did is we uh, analyzed the Japanese company, understand the history, the background. Uh, they went through restructuring, we found out, we looked at who is the top management, how is the management organized, and who should we talk to. So in one of the previous slides, I told you it's very important to find out who you talk to in a company. If you want to do M&A, you want to sell, you know, then you have to, uh, the, one of the most important uh, issues is to find out who to talk to in the company. and. Uh, based on you know the analysis, I decided I want to uh, talk to uh, the person who is. If you can read Japanese, it says here Daihyo Torishimariyaku uh, Fukushacho. So this means every Chinese character here, every Japanese character here has a, has a meaning, a legal meaning, and also a, a, a meaning of uh, the job of that person in, in, in the company. You know? Daihyo means representative. That means that he can take decisions on behalf of the company. Uh, Torishi Mareako means board of directors, and Fukushacho means vice president. So uh, we had a first meeting. It was myself. Uh, uh, just one on one plus one person from the corporate strategy office. So we had three of us a meeting. And then uh, about three months later, we had a meeting between the division uh, managing director from Europe, myself, uh, the person from the representative uh, from Hong Kong of the European company, plus people from corporate strategy office department heads. So we were like about six, seven people in the room. Interestingly, at that point, this board of director, vice president was not in the room. But uh, so then because of the preparation, we could achieve a uh, positive response within tw 12 hours. The Japanese company within 12 hours uh, gave an initial yes to the proposal from the European side. So I'm uh, just showing here three uh, case studies of uh, companies which uh, went wrong. One is uh, Vodafone, the, uh, which essentially the, the, the two reasons why Vodafone failed in Japan is uh, they didn't invest enough, uh, enough money in Japan. And secondly, is they didn't uh, HR issues. They didn't have the right managers in Japan. The second one is Nasdaq and London Stock Exchange. AIM both failed. And then Volkswagen with Suzuki as well. So in the last slide, if you go to the next slide, please, the last one is a summary, which is essentially a list of questions to you. So what do you want to achieve in the long term in Japan and why? Then how much are you ready to invest or are you looking for investment? Because to build business in Japan, somebody will have to invest. So that has to be either you from your balance sheet or from your investors or your banks or it has to be investment from Japan, which we're looking, you're looking to attract into your company. Then what is your value proposition in Japan? What is your competition? Uh, who should you be talking with and pick the right people to talk with? And then uh, don't learn from your own mistakes, but learn from uh, previous already done mistakes of others. Okay, thank you.